Good morning. I want to say welcome back. Some of you we haven't seen for a few weeks, and summer's coming down to the end. And uh, you know, last week was like one of our largest services uh, in several months. It was really incredible. And so we know everyone's coming back from vacation, getting ready for a school year that starts in a few days. And so I just want to tell you, welcome back. Welcome home. We're happy to have you guys here with us today. My name is Chad. I'm one of the pastors here. I'm the missions pastor here at FBC. Uh, I'm, the, I'm the, the pinch hitter this week. Uh, three of our executive team are in Israel with 40 plus members of our church. If you're on Facebook like me, you can be jealous every day as they post pictures of hanging out in places like the Jordan River or you know the Sea of Galilee or on top of these mountainous places that look beautiful. And we're like, well, you know, maybe one day, one day, we too. Anyway, I'll move on. Lots of great things going on in life for our church. Um, you may not know this, but today was Will Haynes, our worship leader's birthday. So if you see Will, you should make sure to say happy birthday to him. <laughs> Earlier he said he turned 19 again. So uh, if you weren't sure, <laughs> lots going on. You know, last time I preached, I, I talked about this idea that there's moments in, in history where God does something unique and special. It's like he splits time and space. And uh, you might think about the language of the, the authors of, of the, uh, the, the gospels that say in the fullness of time, something happened. Jesus came or, or, or uh, Mary was with child or in the fullness of time, these special events happen in those moments where God just opens up and does something unique in the lives of every person that knows him, but sometimes in a corporate level in the life of a church. And uh, today we're going to talk about a story in, in Acts 19 where God does something absolutely unique. In fact, I think it's the culminating event of the book of Acts. What we see today is, is really the culmination of so many of the stories we've led up to over the last several weeks, the last couple of months as we've studied. And I want to just draw your attention to a few verses that we've seen in the last few weeks. And I want you to see kind of the building momentum that's been happening as we get ready for this chapter. You might remember in Acts chapter 17, in verse 4, we're talking about uh, in these places where Paul was stopping and spending some time. But in almost every place, something like this happens. This is in verse 4. It says, some of the Jews were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, as did a large number of God-fearing Greeks and quite a few prominent women. What I want you to see is, is even in this place, there's this large number of believers where Paul stopped. Uh, a, a couple of verses later, verse 12, it says, as a result, many of them believed. Also, a number of prominent Greek women and, Greek, and many Greek men. When you see those words, many, um, and, and you see that a large number, just get this idea that every place that Paul is stopping, God is doing something unique and mighty among the people there. It's like, again, this idea that God is opening up time and space and in the fullness of time, God came near to them and they respond to it. Another verse, skip down, verse seven, this is in chapter 17, verse 34, it says, some of the people, this is in, in Athens, became followers of Paul and believed. Among them was Dionysus, and a member of the Areopagus, and a woman named Damaris, and a number of others. There's not the many in that verse, but you just see that there's multiple people that came to faith while he was in Athens. And then lastly, we're here in, uh, in Corinth, where it says, Crispus, the synagogue leader, and his entire household believed, this is verse, uh, chapter 18, verse 8. And many of the Corinthians who heard Paul believed and were baptized. So I want you to see, as Paul makes his way through Macedonia, over and over then, God does something unique among the people. And it's really easy to breeze over these little places, these little verses where you see that many people come to faith and are baptized. But every place that Paul stopped, every place that's mentioned by name, there's a resulting new believer group. What do you call a group of new believers in a location? Saved, yes, but we call it a church, right? They started gathering together. They encouraged each other, and God began to do something unique among them. So when Paul writes letters to the Thessalonians, it's to the church in Thessalonica, right? When he writes letters to the Philippians, it's to the church in Philippi. When he writes letters to the Corinthians, it's the church in Corinth that he's writing these letters to. Today, we're going to look at a movement that happens in the city of Ephesus. And later on, late in Paul's life, he writes a letter called the book of Ephesians, to the church in Ephesus. So I just want you to see that all these little moments, they add up and that God was doing something unique throughout the whole region. And we're gonna see, I think, the culminating event of that today um, in, uh, in Acts. 
before we get there, I want to tell you, uh, we're going to see a revival. You guys like the word revival? The, the word brings up lots of different things to mind. You might think of uh, the Asbury revival earlier this year. You might think of things like in the 1990s, there was, they called it the Brownsville revival. And sometimes you get some really odd stories out of some of these revival stories. Um, you might think of like old school Baptist revivals when you'd have a week of revival and have church every single night for a week. You guys ever do that? Raise your hand. You ever go to Baptist? Okay, all right, you guys know this Baptist world. And so this revival idea has a lot of different connotations in our world today. But what we're going to see in Ephesus is a really tried and true revival. And, uh, and we'll see what that means uh, in a few minutes. In 2001, I was pastoring at Calvary Baptist Church in the Valley. I was, it was in McAllen, Texas. And... Uh, I was there for 10 years, and many times during the 10 years, we had these surges at the border, and the immigrant surge would, would bring a lot of stress to us at the border, and we're trying to figure out how to care for the humanitarian need, try to help um, meet the needs of those who are stuck in, 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 um, in Reynosa, as well as trying to figure out how to help those who are in transit through the valley, and it was overwhelming for a missions pastor in that area. But in 2001, something unique happened. There was a little park. If you ever walked across the Hidalgo Bridge into Reynosa, there's a park right there. And, and immigrants started putting up tents in that park. And it went from a couple hundred to 500 to over 5,000 people living in this small park in just a short amount of time. So as we're hearing about these stories, some of our partners who are working with in Reynosa uh, started sharing the gospel among them. They said, we think that this is a really unique opportunity for us to see a gospel movement planted among this refugee immigrant people. And so we talked to some friends, uh, missionary partners with E3 partners at the time, and they sent a team down. And uh, what happened is we started sharing the gospel. Within a few days, about 20 people came to faith, and we were so thankful for that. And then they said in a second team, and we took those 20 new believers who'd been baptized, and we trained them on how to share the gospel inside the camp, because they were also refugees. They had a lot in common with the other people living in the camp. And this is what happened. God did something unique and incredible. Within three days, we saw over 300 people make commitments to faith. We saw 30 people get baptized, and that was just the beginning. Within a few months, we had over 1,000 people in that camp had made commitments to faith, and over 100 people had been baptized. And what was happening was incredible because every single day, there was five or six Bible studies, worship times, and prayer times happening within the camp. And then every single day, they would tell us that any new family that came, they would meet them and talk to them, ask them where they were from. They would share their faith with them, ask them if they needed anything. So they would give them tents and, and water and sometimes sleeping bags. And it was just an incredible moment. We saw God take our little bit. We didn't, I only spent two afternoons there. But there were so many people that got involved that what happened in a short amount of time is over a thousand people gave their life to Christ. And we were just so overwhelmed. The whole thing continued for almost a year until Reynosa, the city of Reynosa, um, moved the whole camp and they, they shut the whole thing down. They moved them out into these outskirts. And what was happening is every single week we would find out that people were coming into the U.S., some were going back home, and, uh, and our key leaders consistently changed over. But the great thing is while they were leaving, they were training someone else, so the ministry never stopped happening. And it was this incredible thing. Even today, you know, several years later, two years later, there's a... There's a um, an Excel spreadsheet that has the names of people that came to faith, and there's a WhatsApp group that's keeping track of them, and they're spread out all over the United States and Latin America, and so many are still reporting that they share the gospel, and oftentimes we hear reports of people coming to faith through that thing that happened in that one-year uh, stint there in, in Reynosa. And so it's, it was a micro-movement. It was a micro-moment where God did something unique and special, something we had never seen. Uh, I have pictures, if you want to see them, of baptisms happening in this blue barrel <laughs> right out in front of the cartel-owned um, casino right there on that park. You know, you're thinking the, the cartel probably not thrilled about us baptizing people in their lawn, but it was, uh, it was a fantastic moment. And when I think about this idea of revival, that's the kind of thing I want you to think of, where God does something special and unique in a group of people. And it's something that you really can't plan for. It's not something that you can create, but when he shows up, it becomes so obvious that it's him and him alone. So today in our story, Paul is going to, for the first time, see a massive city, the biggest city that we've seen him in so far. Jerusalem was a city, but it wasn't that big. And Paul ends up in Corinth, and Corinth was a big city as well, but Ephesus is much larger than Corinth. And so in all three of Paul's missionary journeys, when he gets to Ephesus, it's a different beast. It's a different thing than anything we've seen so far. And the Lord shows up 
in a meaningful and powerful way. Let's pray as we live under scripture. Father, we thank you so much for your word. And we pray that today that you will move among us, that God, you'll speak to us, and that God, you'll be here with us. We pray, God, that the words of Luke and the words of your Holy Spirit will prick our hearts, God, that the things you care about will become the things we care about. We love you in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. If you were here last week, you heard Jason's sermon, and he was talking about the really introduction of, of Paul arriving in Ephesus. And he got to the end of the sermon, he talked about how a, a people whose life is, is changed by Christ exhibits fruit. Do you guys remember that part? He talked about fruitfulness, and, and he talked about the, the fruits of the Spirit that we find in the book of Galatians. It says, the fruits of the Spirit are love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, and self-control. You guys remember that? And, and I want you to remember that this idea that when God moves inside of you, really you, the inside of you begins to change. The fruitfulness that happens interior to your life uh, begins to exhibit itself in the way that you live in your exterior. And I want to talk about, just mention real quick, that the, the faithful life of a believer is not just an interior change. There's exterior fruit that is also very obvious in the life of a believer. It's what Will was talking about a, little, a few minutes ago when he was talking about this idea that Jesus said, not my will, but yours be done. There's an interior motive that makes Jesus' faithfulness very obvious to him, but the exterior is obvious to everyone around him, right? That he did something so unique and powerful and different that we're all a little bit stunned by it. And so when we look at this story today, I want you to tell you that, that we're looking for the fruit of what happens when these people's lives are changed. We don't get to examine their interior, but we can see what God's doing based on what they're doing in their, their physical life, their obedience, the way that they walk. And, uh, and I want to just tie that to that verse that you might think of from John 15 that says, uh, if you abide in me and I abide in you, you will bear what? Much fruit, right? You've heard the verse before. We'll, we'll talk about that at the end as well. So revival is the impact of a community of faithful followers of Jesus who are committed to putting him first. And so we're going to see that here today in Acts chapter 19. So turn with me, we'll be in Acts 19 starting in verse 8. And we're going to read the whole section and then we'll go back through it. So it says here that Paul entered the synagogue and spoke there for about three months, arguing persuasively about the kingdom of God. But some of them became obstinate. They refused to believe and publicly maligned the way. So Paul left them. He took the disciples with him and had discussions daily in the lecture hall of Tyrannus. This went on for two years so that all the Jews and Greeks who lived in the province of Asia heard the word of the Lord. God did extraordinary miracles through Paul so that even handkerchiefs and aprons that had touched him were taken to the sick and their illnesses were cured and the evil spirits left them. Some Jews who went around driving out evil spirits tried to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who were demon possessed. They would say, in the name of Jesus, whom Paul preaches, I command you to come out. Seven sons of Sceva, the Jewish high priest, were doing this. One day the evil spirit answered them, Jesus, I know, and I know about Paul, but who are you? Right? Then the man who had the evil spirit jumped on them and overpowered them. He gave them such a beating that they ran out of the house naked and bleeding. When this became known to the Jews and Greeks living in Ephesus, they were all seized with fear, and the name of the Lord Jesus was held in high honor. Many of those who believed now came and openly confessed what they had done. A number who had practiced sorcery brought their scrolls together and burned them publicly. When they calculated, when they calculated the value of the scrolls, the total came to 50,000 drachmas. In this way, the word of the Lord spread widely and grew in power. Amen. Amen. So we're going to see some things that are not surprising. It starts out with Paul going to the synagogue and he stays there for three months, which by the way is one of the longest periods of time we see Paul staying in any synagogue. So while this synagogue ended up the same way as most of the others, he did get to spend sufficient time there with the Jews. But some of them in verse 9 became obstinate and they refused to believe and publicly maligned the way. Does this sound familiar? If you've been walking through this study with us, this is a very common kind of circular thing that happens. Paul goes first to the Jews in the synagogue, and then after a little while, they get very upset with him, and he's forced to, to leave there. 
And I want you to tell you that's actually very true today. The people uh, who are the most resistant voices to the gospel are often the ones who have the most to lose because of the gospel. Oftentimes the people who are the most religious are the ones who are most afraid to surrender themselves to Christ. And this can happen in, in many world religions. It can happen if you're a devout Muslim. It can happen if you're a devout Buddhist. It can happen if you're a devout legalist. It can happen if you're a devout humanist. When you find out that Jesus re, uh, frees people from their bondages, sometimes it takes away some of the things that we gain from our religion. And so this is not uncommon. In fact, it happens throughout the world today. When people experience Jesus in a meaningful way, oftentimes it brings revival to their heart and often it brings riot around them. <laughs> people get upset. And if you know this story, what Jason's gonna preach on next week is the riot in Ephesus. Oftentimes revival leads to riot. <laughs> and that's a dangerous thing. So what does Paul do? Paul leaves them. He took the disciples with him and had discussions daily in the lecture hall of Tyrannus. This went on for two years. And I want you to see this so that all the Jews and Greek who live in the province of Asia heard the word of the Lord. Now that's just a little by statement in this verse, but think about the impact of this verse. Do you realize that Asia Minor, the place that he's serving, Ephesus, kind of the capital, is the most populated place in the Roman world outside of Italy? Historians estimate that almost 10 million people live in that area. 10 million people in what today we would call Turkey. Think about the kind of movement it would take to be able to say that all the Jews and Greeks that live in the province of Asia heard the word of the Lord. In two years, Paul got around. That's a joke, because he didn't. He stayed in one place. So how did the word of the Lord get to so many people, spread out so far? God did something unique and special among them, and the people that received the message of Paul took that message to many, many others. And so in a few years, the network that was created, the, the movement that happened, was able to saturate an entire area. And what an incredible thing. I think about it like this, here's a formula for you. One Paul, eight disciples, two years, 10 million people, and one Holy Spirit. That's a recipe for revival, folks. Amen? Like I said, this is a big word, revival. Today, often it's a planned event. But a better definition I would use is that an ongoing event where God makes himself known in an extraordinary way among a specific people, group of people who are so overwhelmed by God's presence that they go and tell everyone, triggering a, cyclic, a cyclical response that's ever widening. Revival is when God grabs you and you have to tell people about it. And then that starts a cycle where they've got to go see it for themselves. And then God grabs them and they've got to tell everyone about it. And it goes over and over and over and that happens throughout an entire community or sometimes a region or sometimes even beyond. And that's what we're gonna see here. Here's how Luke describes revival. Verse 11, that God did extraordinary miracles through Paul. Even handkerchiefs and aprons that had touched him were taken to the sick and their illnesses were cured and evil spirits left them. Has anyone experienced miracles like that? No, you hear about stories like that and sometimes they're ridiculous, right? They're like, yeah, I'm not sure I believe that at all. But here in this story, does anyone doubt that what Luke wrote was meaningful and powerful in the moment? The, the, the issue of miracles comes up often uh, if you talk to believers. Um, it's one that makes people a little bit nervous because we can't count on it, right? You have faith and we know that God can do it, but he doesn't always do what we ask. In fact, oftentimes we wonder if he does anything we ask and we, we wonder if he's listening at all. But there are places in the world where we hear of miracles a lot. Do you know that? Some of them coming from our Baptist missionary brothers and sisters, they're telling of stories, especially when they're engaging the unreached, when they're engaging places where the gospel's never been. Uh, I was in, in, in India a few years ago and we were meeting with new believers in India and we were asking them, what is it that brought them to faith in Christ? And almost every single one gave testimony of a miracle. 
They would say something like, my, my, my brother was dying and he was in his bed and they'd already talked to the witch doctor, they'd already talked to the Buddhist uh, priest and they'd come and they'd done all these different things and it wasn't working. And someone knew a Christian and they said, sometimes God does something unique through these Christians. So they called the Christian, he came and laid hands on him and prayed for him and the next day he was up and healed so our whole family became believers. It was so simple and you're like, wait a second, can I just dial down here? What did you say? You know, we wanna, we're trying to want to get a formula or the method or... The, but, but it really wasn't that. It was that these people who were far from God needed something unique like that for them to even believe that God was there or that he cared. And over and over, you know, almost every Muslim that comes to faith reports having a vision of Jesus. It's so common that missionaries who work among the Muslim people groups will tell you that they first ask somebody, have you ever had a dream of a guy in white? And they go, how did you know? So, well, I know the guy in white. Let me tell you about him. They're like, okay, I wanna hear about this. And, and it's reported over and over on the millions of times scale. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not exaggerating. Millions of, of Muslims have come to faith because Jesus is showing himself to them in their dreams. And then they look for someone who can tell them about the man in white. Or they might ask him about the people of the book. The Quran references the people of the book, the Bible, and that the people of the book will also be in heaven one day. So they wanna know who are the people of the book and what does the book say? Over and over again, God does unique things when you're engaging people who are far from God. And that's a really a challenge for us. Uh, oftentimes we wonder why God doesn't do those miracles for us. I would tell you one is because we already have the hope that is in Christ. We know that when we die, we actually do fine, don't we? Paul says, it's better for me to depart and be with Christ, but for your sake, I'll stay here. Right, it's, it's better for us, and, and so that's one thing. The other thing is we have a, a society and a culture where we look at everything else first. Right, if you get sick, how many of you go to get anointed by the elders and prayed for with hands on? First thing I do is I call the doctor's office. Right, and then I get some medicines and I give it some time. Most of us understand that God has provided for us in so many other ways that our spiritual um, the spiritual hope is kind of our last result. It's our, our last result? No, it's, our, it's the last place we turn to. And so, without commenting too much on this idea of miracles, I want you to know that they still happen. We hear reports of it all over the place. But oftentimes, God uses those things to show himself faithful where people have never heard of him before. Which is why I think you see it so often in the book of Acts. Every place that Paul goes is an unreached place. It's a place where the gospel has never been. And so he's reaching out to a people that have never heard of the stories of Christ before, the stories of God before, even the stories of the Jews before. And God is abundantly showing himself faithful. What an incredible thing. Put yourself in a position with the lost and see if God doesn't show up. I wanna hear those stories, okay? Go, go someplace where there's never been the gospel and tell me how that goes. Because I bet you we'll see God do something unique, different than what we expect. It was so amazing what God was doing that even the non-believers thought they could do it, right? They found out there's power in this name of Jesus, so even these guys who weren't Christians thought they could cast out demons in the name of Jesus. Now that's pretty unique, don't you think? Isn't it amazing that God showed himself so faithful that people who were not even followers thought they could use Jesus' name and do something powerful with it. So they're casting out demons in Jesus' name and in Paul's name. And it doesn't go very well for them, does it? So if you pick up the story, verse 13, so the Jews, some Jews went around driving out evil spirits. And uh, you look at verse 15, the one day that the spirit answered them, Jesus I know and Paul I know, but who are you? Then the man who had the evil spirit jumped on them and overpowered them. He gave them such a beating that they ran out of the house naked and bleeding. So this is still in that, that story of what was happening in this revival in Ephesus. Jesus was moving powerfully through Paul in Jesus' name. Then there's this crazy story. And look what happens, verse 17. When this became known to the Jews and Greeks living in Ephesus, they were, look at the word, all. This is a very, very famous story. They were all seized with fear and the name of the Lord was held in high honor. Many of those who believed now came and openly confessed what they had done. The impact of the gospel had already been moving throughout Ephesus, but with this story, it was like this, this heavy, 
kind of compounding moment where people were like, my goodness, this is not to be mocked. This is, this is a powerful moment where God has, been, has made himself known to an entire city, a big city. And now people are in fear of his name and they're willing to glorify God most high. What an amazing moment. What an incredible thing that happened here. Look at the, that idea that many, again, we have saw it in, in, in chapter 17, we saw it in chapter 18, and now here in chapter 19, many believed. And the impacts continue. Look at verse 19. A number of those who practice sorcery, now just to stop for a second, how many of you have practiced sorcery? Is this a common thing? No, it's not in our culture for sure. But think about the people who practice sorcery. If you had to imagine what they were like, do you think they're people that go to church regularly? regularly? Are these people that are filling our pews on a regular Sunday? They're not. These are people that serve something very different than the God that we worship. They don't look and practice and worship like we do. In fact, if we were to think about it, they worship something very different, maybe the exact opposite, right? And look what happened. They're so impacted by the gospel, and there's so many of these sorcerers that they took their scrolls and burned them publicly. What would it take to see someone who's devoted themselves so much to practicing sorcery and magic that they bring it all together into a local place in the middle of the city and they burn it together? What kind of impact is that? And then look, it says, when they calculated the value of the, value of the scrolls, it came to 50,000 drachmas. Does anyone know how much 50,000 drachmas is worth? I checked, just so you know. It's basically a day's wage. A, a drachma was a day's wage. It was a, a one silver coin. Uh, today, the equivalent is five and a half million dollars. If you got all the sorcerers together from Bernie and we burned all of their books, how much do you think it'd be worth? I have no idea. I don't know if there's sorcerers in Bernie. But here's, here's my point. The gospel so impacted the city that people who were worshiping something opposite of the gospel gave up a huge amount of wealth to repent on a public level. Can you imagine? Verse 20 is kind of the end of it. It says, in this way, the word of the Lord spread widely and grew in power. You know, I, I mentioned earlier that this is kind of the capstone of Paul's missionary journeys. The first journey into Galatia was in many smaller villages. Uh, they impacted a lot of people and he, he found a couple of disciples. Gaius and Timothy came from that area. Journey two, he, he's prevented from going into Bithynia, the north. He's prevented from going into Ephesus in the south. And he ends up going to Philippi and through Achaia down to Corinth. And that's the biggest city that he interacts with. While he's in Corinth, he picks up two people. You might remember this. It was in Jason's sermon a few weeks ago, Priscilla and Aquila. Aquila is a Jew who's also a tent maker, and Priscilla is part of the royal family from, from Rome. They got kicked out when Claudius, the emperor, kicked out all the Jews from Rome. They moved to, 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 Corinth, to Corinth. And so that's when Paul interacts with him. When he leaves Corinth, at the end of Second Journey, he goes to Ephesus and he drops off Priscilla and Aquila. And they stay there and plant the church while, uh, while Paul goes back to Jerusalem and spends some time, probably a year and a half before he makes it back to Ephesus. And then he spends those couple years there in Ephesus. And, and while this powerful movement, this revival happens in Ephesus, he's discipling his best people. Luke is with him. Priscilla and Aquila are with him. The eight disciples of Paul are with him. And, and these men grow and they begin to, to be partners with the gospel. And they're doing the things that Paul is doing to such an extent that you'll see early in chapter 20, Paul sends uh, uh, Timothy and others out to go do ministry on their own. Here's an important thing. There as Ephesus winds down and Paul begins to, to move and, and powerful things are happening, he sends out a large team that goes and plants the church in Rome. At the end of the book of Romans, you see a list of all the people that left with Paul, and he, or left, that left when Paul sent them. And he, saw, he knows all these people by name, and he's saying, greet these people, but the first ones on the list is a couple named Priscilla and Aquila. Priscilla got to go back home where she was from to Rome, and she hosted the first church in Rome. So think about this couple, this Priscilla and Aquila that started there in Corinth, goes with them and helps plant the church in Ephesus, and then goes and plants the church in Rome. 
There are some uh, missiologists, they're, they're missions experts, historians, that say that, that this movement from Ephesus is the greatest movement in human history. That what started there and the overwhelming impacts of what came out of Ephesus continues to impact us today. You know, I want to ask you a question. What's it going to take, church, to see God make himself known in such a powerful way here? In Bernie and in the Hill Country. What would it take? What's it going to take to see God do something so unique and special among a specific people group, maybe this one here, sitting together, that the world will see him and want him desperately? What would it take? It's going to take great faith. It's going to take a family of faith that's willing to put Christ first in their lives. It's going to take a people who are willing to see the needs of the world as worthy of spending ourselves. It's going to cost us something. You know, five or ten years after Paul's work in Ephesus, <clears throat> he's in Rome, he's under house arrest. He's waiting to see the Emperor Nero to, to find out what his fate will be. And he writes this letter to the Ephesians. You have it in your Bible, you've probably read it. It's a powerful letter. And I want you to look at these verses with me, Ephesians 3, 14 through 20. And this is just a beautiful picture of Paul's heart for the Ephesian church. So here's Paul in prison, he says this, for this reason I kneel before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ, and to know that this love surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Can you imagine? And he continues, now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine according to his power that is, that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Amen. If this is the prayer of Paul for the Ephesians, I would ask that you begin praying that prayer for our church and for our city, those Berneans. I don't know if that's the right way to say it or not. Berneites. That we would grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ, that we'd be filled to the full measure of God, to him who is able. Do you know he is able? He is near to us. And he says he'll never leave us or forsake us. Today, as we come to the end of our, our service, we're gonna take the Lord's Supper. And uh, I was supposed to mention this before I started preaching and I got too excited. But if you haven't gotten one of these yet, uh, our ushers, Dennis back there and others, um, have these. So if you don't have one of the Lord's Supper elements, please raise your hand so we can get you one real quick. If you're a believer in Christ, then you're welcome to to participate today in this symbol of remembrance. It's one of the fruits. Do you know that? When you become a believer, the first thing when you repent and believe, we tell you to be baptized. And the next thing is to remember what the Lord has done for you regularly. I think about this verse. I mentioned it earlier, John 15, 7 and 8. It says, if you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit showing yourselves to be my disciples. What do disciples do? They bear much fruit. They bear much fruit. Internally, like Jason was preaching last week, 
externally, like we've been talking about today. The fruit of a community following Jesus is that the community around them gets to find Jesus with them. And so today, as we remember what Christ did, let's purify ourselves, purify our hearts. Just take a moment right now and think about how faithful God has been to you. Think about the moment when he made himself real to you. You gave your heart to him. Think about the many times since then where God has just showed himself faithful over and over. And remember, remember the price that was paid. Remember the price that's continued to be paid. There are billions of people in the world today who are still far from Christ. And God commands us to go and take the gospel to them. We were once as they are now. So as we think about what the Lord did to bring us to faith, let's think about the many who are still waiting. 1 Corinthians eleven twenty three 23 says, For what I received from the Lord is that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, he took the bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much that you sent your Son, who was willing to pay the price that none of us could pay, We thank you for his sacrifice, and we remember in Jesus' name. Let's take the bread together. And in the same way, he took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for the blood that was shed, for for the forgiveness of our sins. God, we pray for those many who have yet to hear the good news. And God, we pray that as we remember what you did, that God, you'll break us, break our hearts for those who are far from you. Thank you for your sacrifice. Thank you for your blood. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's take it together. When you see a story like this in Ephesus, I hope that it grabs your heart. I hope that you think of the people who you know who are far from God. I hope you think about the people who you know who are are desperately searching for truth in their life and have yet to find it. Today, if you came into this place and you're far from God, Today is a day to start your relationship with him. It's a day to surrender. It's a day to put aside all that you think you know and to seek the one who made you. Don't wait a moment longer. Today is a day to repent of your sin. It's a day to repent of your religion. It's a day to turn to Jesus. For those of you who are followers of Christ already, today is a moment to take heart and be filled with the knowledge that God is near and he does not leave us or forsake us. You are not alone, no matter how difficult things might seem right now. And lastly, for those of you who call yourselves followers of Jesus, be faithful. Be faithful, abide in him, and let him abide in you. And as such, be fruitful internally and externally. Let us be filled with his love that changes us from who we were to being more like him every day. That we be filled with the fruit of the spirit and that that fruit would remain, that it would last, that it would abide and that we would see God do amazing things in us. As we worship today, if you wanna make any steps in your faith, you wanna ask Jesus to be your Lord and Savior, come and meet me here at the front. We have prayer people, prayer warriors that will be here at the edge, welcoming, that will pray for you if you have needs. But today's the day, turn to him and do not be overwhelmed. Jesus, we thank you so much for your word and we pray that you would move in us mightily, that God, your spirit would speak and that, God, we would obey. The Lord, we would hear your voice and respond. In Jesus' name.